Well, it's my particular pleasure to welcome everybody here, especially Joe Davis and uh, Bonnie um, uh, van Fucht. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. My name is Mia Lam Hayes. I'm Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art History here at the UFA, and I'm also the person um, who is um, taking care of the art science theme at the EAS Institute of Advanced Study. The director of the Dice Room is, will join us later. And we uh, have here with us Esme Hack as well, who, who was the um, artist in residence, or as we like to say, art science fellow over the last year and a bit until recently. So um, it's a, a nice gathering here. Um, art science at, uh, at the UFA is a relatively new area and um, we had a few little sort of inaugural events over Zoom during COVID, so on, but this is the right kind of occasion to, to really start it properly in person and uh, with um, nobody better I could possibly imagine but Joe Davis. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I actually thought of your work when uh, the idea of having artists in residence and art science theme uh, was muted, first of all. Um, I'm not myself specialized in bio art or uh, your work as such, but I came across it 20 years ago or so uh, when a colleague, James Elkins, contributed an article about your work uh, to a themed journal that I was uh, editing. And uh, you had programmed poetry into the DNA of frogs, as far as I remember at the time. And uh, it is a work that has really so much um, yeah, stayed with me and um, even grown on me over these 20 years or more, because um, what says more clearly that indeed other species such as frogs reptiles and so on will outlast humanity and that there is something to be uh, something to be kept something worth keeping of the the creativity that uh, we are jointly producing um, i personally think that you're a giant in art and science and, uh, on the left. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I like what you say as well, that um, uh, you can't, um, you can't dis distinguish or, or prize apart the um, art and science disciplines, they go together. I teach artistic research here and um, my students are also always asked, yeah, so what are you doing in this area and that area and what distinguishes art from life and so on. Uh, maybe art and art science in particular, I suppose, in this kind of institutional frame are added intensities um, to look at things more thoughtfully and um, act according to the affordances that both art and science give us. In, in order to make meaning, in order to um, get together like we are getting together here. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased that you're here. Thank you for coming. And thank you to Bonnie in particular, um, my student. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm very proud indeed uh, of you. You're a part of the research, uh, artistic um, research, research masters, the art and performance uh, studies, research masters. And it's such a pleasure to see how the students who come with um, sometimes relatively vague ideas or what is even more difficult with very precise ideas <laughs> about uh, what they want to do. And if I have an orientation phase for all of you, COVID wasn't the easiest time to, to develop your interests and so on and then just see you uh, pinpointing exactly where you need to go, um, finding in Joe a very um, hospitable host, very open collaborator and letting our students 
and participate in what you do. So it's, it's wonderful that you're both giving this presentation together. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, for the invitation. <laughs> yeah, it's, Mia's words are, I think, uh, surprisingly appropriate for what we're about to uh, uh, express. Shall we begin? Yeah, let's start. <laughs> Okay, so in a sort of a one person micro performance in the spring of this year, partly reiterating the stunts of uh, the Greek philosopher Diogenes, who I wandered around the streets of a small German city, uh, Jena, carrying a lamp in the day and claiming to be searching for the truth. In the fourth century, BC, Diogenes went looking for an honest man. I guess that's sort of the same thing. In the middle of the day, with <laughs> a few days later, my newfound collaborator, Bonnie Van Boot, and I unveiled one of my large anthropomorphic sculptures in the atrium of a company there called Blink DX. Blink DX specializes in innovative bioanalytic technologies, but they also have an eye for art, obviously. Over the next few days, Bonnie and I collaborated with two Blink DX employees, engineer Thomas Kaiser and chemist Torsten Schultz, to precisely encode language into a glass of water. The water was encoded with the English word truth. So what's going on here? What did we do? How did we do it? Why did we do it? What follows is our humble effort to answer some of those questions. In 1946, the Argentinian writer and poet Jorge Luis Borges <coughs> published a one paragraph short story about the map of the world that coincided precisely with the world itself. Borges envisioned an empire where a guild of cartographers were embodied, embodying the highest respected and most sophisticated of the sciences. And the goal of the cartographers guild was to create maps that were ever more complete and ever more detailed. And as a result of this, the maps grew larger and larger <clears throat> until they finally managed to produce a map of the empire that was the same size of the empire itself. But unfortunately, the following generation had big problems with such a big map. And Borges concluded that such a map was useless to the science of geography. But now it seems that a map of the world that coincides precisely with the world itself might not be so utterly useful. Useless, useless after all. Microvenus, the first DNA information keeping molecule, was also a map of sorts. It contained the digital map of an ancient Nordic icon. It also happened to be a not so subtle criticism of this serious search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The Milky Way DNA created in the early 1990s was an information keeping DNA molecule two with 3,867 bases that held the map of the Milky Way galaxy. Despite the fact that these were created as works of art, Microvenus and several projects that followed were the very first examples of DNA information keeping and now have been widely cited as such in scientific literature. <laughs> Meanwhile, a whole new industry has emerged based on these ideas. DNA has now been used to hold entire books, movies, computer operating systems, and even all of Wikipedia. An unspoken aspiration of information keeping in DNA is the notion of a greater biological archive, one in which the whole terrestrial biome becomes an incontrovertible perpetual record of human culture and civilization. But there are some problems with this idea. International law requires that genetically modified organisms, including plants and animals, must be kept in very strictly enforced physical containment. The only exceptions to this rule are organisms such as certain genetically engineered crops that undergo extremely thorough and rigorous testing and review. Oops. For now, at least, um, 
the wholesale release of recombinant organisms into the environment is pretty much out of the question. But there may be another way to invite our vision to the world around us. Many common materials are made up of many different substances. Examples of such bulk materials are sand and concrete, mixtures of fragrances that make up aromas and flowers and perfumes, and even the minuscule traces of minerals in drinking water all fall into this category. These materials can hold information by precisely drying their amounts of their respective ingredients. Consecutive data can be stored non-consecutively in these mixtures, and then the data can be retrieved in the proper sequence by distinguishing between their incremental chemical and physical properties. On the other hand, most databases are consecutive linear constructions with an inherent chronological order having clear start and end points. Letters typed in one character at a time to make up a line of text and the consecutive sequence of nucleotide bases that make up the uh, uh, information keeping DNA molecules are both examples of linear encoding. An encoding method is non-linear when data resides in random mixtures rather than as information rendered step by step. The units of nonlinearly encoded data are not physically connected to each other, and so they are not arranged into adjacent or physically connected sets. In May of this year, interest in the prospect for such nonlinear archives prompted our request to the Municipal Water Authority in Vienna, Germany, for a list of mineral salts that normally appear in drinking water. The Water Authority graciously compiled, complied with that request and responded with the list of minerals and the ranges of their appearance considered to be safe in drinking water. So, how do you encode the word truth? The American Standard Code for Information Inner Exchange, or ASCII, is an international character encoding standard for electronic communications. ASCII code is a digital code for writing language, and it is the prevailing method for um, representing text, numbers, and punctuation in computers, electronics, telecommunications equipment, and other devices. Truth was encoded into water by expressing ASCII as a solution of minerals that appear in drinking water. ASCII numbers are binary, and since any number base can be readily converted to any other number base, there are also decimal equivalents for the ASCII numbers that represent characters in the word truth. In this case, since five-bit ASCII codes are expected, zeros are added as suffixes to smaller numbers to convert them to readable five-bit ASCII numbers. We translated decimal equivalents of, de of ASCII numbers into numbers of milligrams per liter of dissolved minerals, and this strategy allowed us to encode the word truth into water by adding precise quantities of five different minerals. We started with one liter of ultra pure water and five water soluble minerals, uh, sodium chloride salt, magnesium <laughs> chloride, potassium chloride, calcium chloride, and magnesium nitrate. Once mineral salts go into aqueous solution, their crystalline structures dissociate into sets of positively charged cations and negatively charged anions. In this case, sodium chloride dissolves into separate sets of sodium and chloride ions. The five soluble minerals were added in carefully measured quantities so that the presence of their component elements in our solution would coincide with designated quantities that exactly correspond with ASCII code for alphabetical letters and truth. Because all of these minerals become randomly distributed in solution, we needed a method to recover them in the correct order. In the laboratory, random mixtures of DNA fragments are often labeled with extra additional fragments of DNA, euphemistically called barcodes. These added sequences can be used to match various DNA fragments for subsequent assembly or to mark their in interactions with uh, other biomolecules. 
Likewise, microscopic physical or chemical tagants are sometimes added to bulk materials to distinguish authentic products from counterfeits, provide traceable lot numbers and company names, detect cross-contamination or dilution of proprietary products in agriculture, pharmaceuticals, plastics, inks, and explosives. Like DNA barcodes, industrial tagants are additive. Adding such markers to initial DNA allows random mixtures of information keeping particles to be reconfigured into familiar linear formats. But since sets of these unique markers must be first be created, then added to, and later removed from final assemblies, methods of marker-dependent recovery of input data call for increases in both the volume of encoded material and in the complexity of the decoding process. Instead, queuing of stored data can be accomplished by sorting random mixtures according to properties of their component materials that are naturally incremental and so do not increase the volume of information storage. For any given material, there are many different characteristics to choose from, including optical, mechanical, electrical, and thermal properties. <coughs> Here, we've taken advantage of the incremental molecular weight of encoded minerals, where numbers indicating quantities of the lightest substance are gathered first, and then the next heaviest, and then the next, and so on. Increments of molecular weight serve as a kind of clock to recover information in chronological order so that the dissolved random mixture can be uh, correctly reconfigured into the linear sequence initially encoded as T-R-U-T-H. We were therefore able to uh, encode information into water by precisely controlling concentrations of dissolved materials and assigning their order of appearance according to respective molecular weights. We've actually, there's kind of an appendix on this talk. If anybody really wants to know, we have lots of detail about how we uh, did the chemistry to do this. And there you have it, our proof of concept pilot project in nonlinear encoding of bulk materials. The truth has never been quite so transparent. <laughs> And there's no small irony <laughs> like, oh, the, on the very same day that we encoded the truth water, Donald Trump launched his truth social fake news media <laughs> platform. <laughs> so we see that at best the truth seems to be very untidy. Like, you would think that there will be laws against such things. Well, it happens that in the US there are the so-called blue sky laws. They're state laws enacted in the early 20th century to protect the public from fraud. And the earliest recorded use of the blue sky term by the US Supreme Court was an opinion by just Joseph McKenna in 1917, citing speculative schemes which have no more basis than so many feet of blue sky. Or as stated by a counsel in another case, to stop the sale of stock in fly-by-night concerns, visionary oil wells, distant gold mines, and other like fraudulent exploitations. But apparently those laws seem to have fallen out the window some time ago. So we have undertaken several expeditions into the blue sky to see what we might find there. Here you see us last spring in Thuringia in the sky, well, Thuringia in hot air balloon. Riding dragons. And last summer in <laughs> gliders in skies above Eastern Massachusetts. We were towed up to 900 meters or so by workhorse aircraft and then released riding thermals over 1500 meters. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one of our landings. And note the resting air here at the moment. Okay. 
So we discovered that high-performance gliders sometimes use water dumps as ballast to alter the rates of ascent and descent. And a glider can carry up to 30 to 15 gallons or 100 to 200 liters of water for these purposes, which is a much, a much smaller quantity of liquid than might be discharged from commercial crop dusters or firefighting aircraft but contracting such an aircraft would be very expensive and our glider flights will be carried out at very low amount cost. So now let's return to the notion of Borges empire. And it turns out that now we might in fact have an opportunity to make a map that coincides with the world itself. Here you see an aviator's map of the uh, aviator sector map of the airfield at Sterling, which is where we have been flying gliders. It's an accurate map in many respects, except that it is not <laughs> the relationship between object and representation of that object is never absolutely perfect. Or as the Polish American philosopher Alfred Wojcicki stated, the map is not a territory or the world or and the world is not the thing. And the surrealist artist René Magritte illustrated this concept in a famous work entitled The Treachery of the Images, a drawing of a pipe with the caption, This is not a pipe. The aviator, aviator sector map of the airfield at Sterling, Massachusetts is accurate in many respects, except that the Sterling airfield is not actually a rectangle as rendered on the sector map, the Sterling airfield as a pointy end. Here we've created a digital map of the Sterling airfield that can be encoded with only seven minerals. It's a seven bit by five bit map like the 1980s microvenous code and it assembles in a very similar way. We've now recruited a hotshot glider pilot with high performance gliders willing to release our specially prepared water dump on Sterling Airfield. As part of the process, we gathered soil samples from the airfield and treated them according to pre test protocols outlined by the Massachusetts State Agricultural Extension. The Agricultural Extension has offered this grandfather testing service for many years. Similar services are offered by other states to aid agriculture. And it's much, much less expensive than the independent mass spectroscopy services we contracted for in Germany to verify the relative quantities of our minerals in encoded water. Um, the first Massachusetts Agricultural Extension test results arrived in early October. These will help, help us to determine which minerals common to many soils are absent from the soils at Sterling, the airfield is nutrient poor and to evaluate prospects for modifying quantities of minerals already there. We think that nonlinear encoding techniques might be applied to reformulate flame retardants and agricultural chemicals for purposes of information keeping too, since these are already released in massive quantities across large swaths of landscape. We assume that plants will take up some of the minerals we disperse on the airfield Given that commercial horticulturalists commonly colorize cut flowers with vegetable dyes, we carried out several experiments with flowers and mixtures of colorizing compounds to see whether or not plants might naturally separate compounds in a way similar to how liquid chromatography is used to, dis to separate dissolved minerals. Not all of the mixtures we tried were taken up by plants, but separations of some of the mixtures were readily observed. Look plant chromatography. Um, professor of genetics, Harvard professor of genetics, George Church suggested that we might carry out serial liquid dispersals with several different water soluble minerals so that soluble minerals absorbed in plants from earlier dispersals would react with soluble minerals from later dispersals to form insoluble reaction products. When two aqueous solutions are mixed, the ions interact to form reaction products in a precipitable form if the resulting compound is insoluble in water. Theoretically, these would remain fixed or stable in host plants. The liquid in this image has barium ions in it and the liquid being added has sulfate ions. 
With these mix, the barium ions combine with the sulfate ions to form solid barium sulfate, seen here as a white cloud of precipitate. When an aqueous solution of sodium chromate is added to an aqueous solution of silver nitrate, a bright red precipitate of silver chromate is formed, the red precipitate in this image. In another example, a nitrate solution mixed with the solution of magnesium bromide will precipitate insoluble silver bromide. Many precipitates occur in bright colors and many such reactions are possible. We imagine that this technique might be used to non-biologically encode information into seedlings of long-lived species, such as the sequoia tree. And but furthermore, we think that this might be economically realized where the trees are being grown for various reforestation targets. And since nonlinear encoding does not call for genetic man manipulation of plants, we do not anticipate ethical or re regulatory issues that automatically complicate the release of GM plants into the environment. Hi. <laughs> At an earlier stage, stage, we had in fact been thinking about genetically modifying certain plants. For instance, more than 315 genes have been identified that contribute to the aroma of roses, and data could be encoded by regulating the expressions of those genes. But since the rose is a woody plant, and um, um, the process of the rose genetic modification takes several years at best, require a dedicated laboratory, full-time attention of specialized, um, highly skilled professionals. These considerations would mean that the product to encode roses would be both very expensive and time consuming. So we decided for another option, namely the nonlinear encoding of the components of a perfume. And our pilot project calls for encoding music into specially compounded fragrance. At this point, uh, our technique for encoding music stems from strategy worked out years ago uh, to encode the 64 key keyboard. The 63 notes in the 73, 74 key, key, 63 63 notes 64 keyboards. <laughs> Can be coded with six bits each. So many ingredients of popular perfumes are synthetics, uniformly made up of single molecules rather than complex multi-molecule natural fragrances. And for purposes of our proof of concept aroma encoding project, single molecule synthetics will be easier to compound in nonlinear encoding scheme, since the single molecule synthetics will be easier to increment by molecular weights or by some other particular material property. Many synthetic fragrances are commercially available and tend to be much less expensive than natural oils. What we're planning to do is encode a fragrance with a few bars of Frederick Chopin's Nocturne number nine. But we might find other arrangements more suitable since whatever we create has to smell pleasantly. And that will have to be an aesthetic call we have to make while we compound the ingredients. We might call it synesthesia. Techniques for nonlinear encoding of bulk materials may never achieve the same information density as in bits per given volume that can rival the storage capacity of DNA molecules. But this begs an important question. As the encoding technique we described depends on the number of available encodable substances, just how many exist to start with? According to compounds registered in the Chemical Abstract Service, Division of the American Chemical Society, more than 100 million chemical compounds make up our world. Um, and what's truly amazing is the fact that it takes a mere 100 plus elements to make up all 100 million chemical compounds. We've been thinking about going one step further and considering chemical synthesis of molecules having specially selected numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons. We've explained how we can use numbers of, say, milligrams per liter to encode ASCII characters 
but we, we might also use numbers of protons, neutrons, etc., in various chemical compounds for that same purpose. Since these components of molecules and atoms can be associated with varying numbers and incremental mass, theoretically, information-keeping molecules might be chemically synthesized to hold information regardless of their quantities in a given mixture. Since any particular number selected for encoding will be likely to correspond with large numbers of uh, particles and many different chemical compounds, the choice of compounds can be made with respect to such factors as convenience, toxicity, and ease of synthesis. This is so anyway, these ideas are not just about encoding the biosphere. We can finish the job. <laughs> Techniques for mass encoding of non-biological bulk materials suggest that parts of the inanimate Earth might also be configured to hold a legacy of human archives. And there's something else to consider. This inanimate Earth is far older than us, possibly older than life itself, and will likely persist for much longer too. A few years ago, we learned how to maintain intact information keeping DNA for hundreds of millions of years. We found dormant salt loving organisms called halobiles residing in ancient mineral salts. We thoroughly sterilized external surfaces of our salt samples and were still able to recover live organisms from in internal parts of these samples. So far, the oldest we found come from the deep deepest salt mine in North America, the Cargill Cayuga mine in Lansing, New York. These salts are primary samples, that is, they have never been redissolved and recrystallized since they were initially deposited some 485 million years ago. These are remarkably survivable organisms. They're called extremophiles because they can thrive in environments that would be instantly fatal to most other life forms. They can withstand enormous thermal extremes, desiccation, oxidative stress, routine exposure to high UV, huge doses of gamma radiation and prolonged exposure to the vacuum of space. They've also survived the greatest extinction events in history. And in 2019, my collaborators and I carried out some of the first genetic manipulations and the first ever DNA information keeping in these halophilic extremophiles. We've since recrystallized them in salt and have revived them once every year until now, but we really don't know in absolute terms how long they can be expected to survive. You'd think that survival for nearly half a billion years is a long time, but the non-biological Earth will certainly, almost certainly survive much longer. The demise of the Earth's crust can only happen when it's drawn into the Earth's core along continental tectonic subduction zones, or later when the Earth is finally swallowed whole by the expanding sun. These events will occur on the order of at least a billion years from now, not hundreds of millions of years. And it's perhaps this relative immortality that's inspired human beings to assign sacred qualities to certain stone monoliths venerated by many cultures around the world. Stone sentinels watching over eons of geologic time with remorseless, unwavering <laughs> patience. Perhaps it's their communion with things non-human and primordial, their implicit connection with all the planets and moons and the distant stars that's given them this special place in the human imagination. Common sand can consist of hundreds of different unique materials. And since encoding substances can be added to bulk materials in relatively minuscule amounts, the mineral content of deserts and glaciers could be modified with secondary substances dropped from the air. These ideas might also have implications for SETI <coughs> through the patient with extraterrestrial intelligence. Surfaces of biota-free environments such as comets and asteroids might be intentionally modified to serve as message keeping bodies for natural dispersal into interplanetary and interstellar environments. And this image is an original image of our uh, astrophysics friends. <laughs> of the dimorphous asteroid impact several weeks ago. He ran the telescope in Tenerife, Canary Islands, and if so, 
This is definitely uh, commons, what's it called? Creative. Creative commons. <laughs> oh, that's why I saw it before. We tend to think of libraries in conventional terms where information is organized and kept in familiar forms like books and tapes are coded onto hard drives of computers. But it's a mistake to think of information keeping merely as collection of binary digits, tedious sequences of DNA bases, or so many command lines of Linux, JavaScript, or C++. Codes are systems of signals symbols, gestures, colors and textures, shapes and forms that are coupled with procedures for meaningfully combining them. Information science, on the other hand, has become the study of structures intentionally removed from meaning and purpose. When commenting on Claude Shannon's invention of information theory, physicist Hans Christian von Bayer has noted that Shannon, quote, invented a way to measure the amount of information in a message without defining the word information itself, nor even addressing the question of meaning, the meaning of the message. In this sense, it makes no difference whether a binary digit represents the toss of a coin or the fate of the universe. Yet words and images are not created solely to be transmitted and received. Information and meaning are both abstract nouns. Every character of text, every number and pixel is a cipher, an estimation. Nothing is simple. Nothing is just zero or one, black or white. Everything has texture, nuance, the measure of what is true and real and what is not. Code is language, music, dance, mathematics and art. It's what we use to hold ideas, the products of reason. Capacity to create and understand meaning is perhaps the single most defining aspect of human nature, the power of imagination to transform and illuminate human lives. We think that encoding truth into water with 41 milligrams per liter of harmless minerals embodies a kind of higher truth. The tragedy of history is that it's a record more of loss than of content. Despite more than 100,000 years of accumulated knowledge, we've forgotten, destroyed, or abandoned much more than humanity can ever remember. Time and again, malice and indifference have caused the brightest flowers of culture and civilization to fade and pass away. But there's another side to, to history, an abiding sense of wonder something that's always whispered to us about what we might become. The part of us that insists on projecting our hopes and fears, the fundamentals of our own particular nature into the unknown. With this project, we imagine a new kind of library, one that might just help to defeat the tragedy of history and where truth has been the first word saved. This is, um, Jorges, Luis Borges, short story, one paragraph short story. So I hate to read from the slides, so I'm going to let you read. You need something to drink. No, I'm good. Thank you. It's okay. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> we want to acknowledge George Church, you know, for his contributions to the project. Steve is our hotshot glider pilot, Thomas Kaiser, engineer at Blink, Ashley Clark, US based photographer, Jay Lee, my sort of mentor. Um, uh, Eric Houston is a Glider pilot student helped us collect samples. Tina Peisker is uh, our European photographer. Uh, Eugen Ermitrod is the CEO of Blink DX, and Thomas Schultz, our chemist friend. Yeah. That's it, except for the details, <laughs> <laughs> which you, you might maybe want to read. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, John, one for this beautiful talk. Um, yeah, I thought um, we can now have some time for questions and discussion, but maybe because we were an intimate ish group, we can just do a very quick round of names and background or anything you'd like to share about your interest in nonlinear coding, uh, but just really briefly. So, may I invite you to start? My name is Mary Kerker. I have an um, art piece in space, um, free play, and I, uh, it's my concrete DNA of the horse. Just one of the horse and the horse hair. Mm -hmm. It's a long story. I'm not going to know, but um, it's, got, it, it's got to do with expanding that the women's point of view are, are, have been done uh, since the on Earth and now we do the rockets and whatever. And it's pretty much like that. Well, yeah. You can see the link. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Dan. I'm uh, from the University of uh, Humanistic Study. And I'm really interested in uh, these concepts of meaning making and the eternity of different ways of uh, describing meaning to, in this case, build materials and how humans want to reach for eternity in such ways. So, uh, yeah, and I also did that. Uh, oh, small. That's, Dan has also been a photographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the other one. My name is Hanif Kamaris, designer and filmmaker. Um, I work at the intersection of art and science. And yeah, for the community faith, but also for the freest artistic mindset of the science. And I'm Jerry Fia Han, thank you. Um, and I design games and research on okay? how, how we can interact and uh, all around the beautiful small ideas. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I'm Ryan. Like I said, I used to be a volunteer. Yes, I'm currently working at um, the Rhine University in Brussels, and the primary work is on the boundary of um, data science, data science. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sophie Isabel. Um, I'm the second uh, story for one. Research, um, uh, this professor, and uh, I'm very getting more and more interested in environmental humanities and host countries, as well as running up in these discussions. Maybe you can. Hello, sorry, I'm 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 sorry, i Thank you all for coming over. Yeah, I'm Julian, and also with money. And I'm just here out of curiosity. Did you like it? I did have a very angry, yeah. I mean, I've been sort of uh, very unconscious, kind of, yeah, sort of, um, I did, I've been going down a rabbit hole of uh, like your uh, mm. Lewis Carroll wrote about the map of the world that yeah. coincided with itself, mm -hmm. too, Sylvia and Bruno. Mm -hmm. Which was the inspiration of oh, For one of our yeah. slides, yeah. The map of nothing. Hi, I'm Nicola Zalaka. I did many years ago the uh, Art Studies Research Master, and but I joined the other professors and that's the most interesting. <laughs> um, I'm Louis. I'm a media artist and a teacher and researcher at the Royal Academy of Art. Um, and funnily enough, I've also just recently been working on how to revive meteorites using 
magnetism to insert an internet technology. So I was quite happy when you mentioned that. <laughs> Everyone, I'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I worked at the, my name's Alex, and I worked at the Royal Academy of Arts in the Hague, where I run a research group called Design and Deep Future, for which uh, you're really uh, and I'm also working here at the industry, which is extremely peripheral to this, but all the better. Um, I'm Annika. I just finished a PhD in architectural economics, and I'm sort of looking towards what I'm going to do now. As I'm a researcher who wants to do more arts, so it would be very, uh, um, very cool to see what what what's going on in this world and um, where it's not actually separate things. So I sort of grew up that art is something different than science, but of course it's just not true. So George accuses me of science constantly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's important, I think, but it's more. So that's uh, how I like it. Um, my name is Pesme Geerkamp. I'm the um, current um, art science or arts in residence fellow here at the IS. Um, I'm working also with chemistry, and in my PhD, I worked with the earth scientists. So I also worked a lot with um, um, archives and yeah, uh, geological histories being encoded in stones and shells. Um, and I made these work so that I think just printed. And, um, oh. Beautiful. Wow. Yeah, beautiful. Apart from what I've already said, I'm interested also in, in codes in the sense of word and image relations and how your work responds to, to how we yeah, make sense through things that are called words now, other things that are called images, and how um, images are also used in all. Um, corners of the university, for example, as an art historian, I feel somewhat responsible for those things. Yeah, yeah really beautiful to hear all your interests, and I already had some um, ideas that there would be some mutual interest in archives and coding. So I was wondering if anyone has a there's also some people, I think, on Zoom, but I'm not yeah, sure yeah. if we can do something about that. <laughs> Not the most hybrid yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, people are, mm -hmm. or, say, or you can say something in the chat also, but I don't know what you um, So, yes. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, thoughts. Mm, I'm, I have a question about, thank you for the talk, it's uh, really enjoyable, um, about readability and legibility. And whether in the process of also nonlinear encoding, you thought a lot about nonlinear decoding, and whether you're also interested in, I don't know, ways in which non humans would be able to read these things, the, the contamination of re reading, and also are these questions for you, or are they questions more for, like you said, what we will become? Well, we haven't really, uh, we haven't really intended these pilot projects to be for aliens, they're for human beings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we wouldn't present them if we didn't know how to decode them. So we used mass spectroscopy to decode the water. We, are, we would use similar analysis as the, the um, Massachusetts Agricultural Extension sort of analysis to recover information from uh, the modified airfield. And also we're actually in, engaged in experiments now with common plants to see if we can fix, if we can make a bright, with bright colors, make fixed codes into the plant without altering their DNA. 
And initially we thought about this as really an accessory rather than a replacement for um, DNA information keeping. But I mean, this we're just sort of scratching the surface now, but if we can encode chemical compounds, given chemical compounds by numbers of by atomic numbers, uh, then we may actually be able to arrive at information density of DNA. But, but it is really interesting. I mean, if you think of like another generation or non humans, uh, I, I don't, I cannot answer that question, but it's interesting to speculate that. <laughs> We've been asked what would we encode again this yeah. these are pilot projects but, and i mean i would think the first thing we want to encode are the languages that we haven't deciphered yet like etruscan mm -hmm. and linear a and the iberian languages and you know those are the messages in the bottle that are mm -hmm. real and of course there's a, a strongly poetic aspect to what we're doing mm -hmm. you know, which if, if that wasn't present, we wouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, otherwise I can, yeah, I have many, many questions. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I found it so touching. Um, to see sort of this desire also to prevent information from getting lost, maybe even more sort of the beauty of language itself and symbols and sort of encoding that mm -hmm. rather than actually the message itself, like the word truth. I mean, that's that's something you can, there's so many layers to the words, like what they mean, but also just the beauty of the word itself and what I really, Find very touching in your presentation and in your works, is sort of this desire to find new ways to speak to each other and to preserve it also. So this um, anxiety for information being lost. Um, we, so don't maybe, know, we don't know where to publish this. We've written some yeah. papers, but ordinarily I publish in scientific journals and archives that have to do with biology. Mm -hmm sometimes in publications for the arts, but this one, I don't know where we're going to... Oh, there's <laughs> different it. versions. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can publish it in the landscape or something. Yeah. <laughs> landscape <laughs> architecture. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. If, you, uh, if you could encode this water with these uh, soluble minerals, what would you write today? What would today be your message to you? Oh, well, practical. The thing is that it cannot really be really long text, mm -hmm. so that's a uh, thing to keep in mind. What's the well, actually, well, yeah. you could add zillions of minerals in minute amounts. It could mm -hmm. be, yeah. you could have substantial amounts, but I think the idea of encoding water is actually more limited than encoding soil because you're limited to what's water soluble. Mm -hmm. um, what would I encode today? Mm -hmm. Could love be an ID? What? Love? Well, I mean, it's just for I mean, people. I mean, I'm a hippie. <laughs> um. I mean, we have the we have the truth water, of course, but the map is we that's like conceptual. We haven't yet encoded that in water, so that's mm -hmm. I, I guess the, the next thing that. We want to materialize. Right, we've decided we're going to use distilled water rather than ultra pure water because ultra pure water is so expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but we think that that's a workable. Mm -hmm. We have to wait until the spring to put it into the glider, though. So, yeah. because the season, you need thermal supply. Mm -hmm. But um, there's the possibility we may have an exhibition at the ZKM in Carl's room. Mm -hmm. Um, they want House of Angels, but we want to uh, we want to exhibit a crop duster loaded with our um, <laughs> with our liquids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so um, would you say because in this story, well, I actually wasn't able to finish the last line. Um, that's in the story of uh, for guests 
in a way it's maybe a bit of a critique on this exactitude of science right if in the way that you try to get a super high resolution where it's the model becomes one and one with reality which of course is never possible but he he did he wrote with a pen and not with molecules yes. so we would have billions upon billions of maps in molecular form in our solution. And mm -hmm. every time you put a map of one scale on top of a map with another scale, at least one point always yeah. coincides. And so since we're distributing so many maps on the airfield, all points will coincide or mm -hmm. this dream comes true. Yeah. But, but the farmers are probably going to be okay with it. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting to me that <laughs> if you look at if I look at science to me, it's also actually a lot about the opposite, more about the abstraction. So you code less information, you leave out the messiness of reality, and you can have more and more abstracted language or models to describe reality. So you're you're kind of doing maybe more Borges light now, right? So you really love the reading incorporating everything and as much information as you can in this well I think, how, how do you do that? I think Borges, Borges imagined a blanket over the landscape where we're going to be much kinder mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's still like still visible another there. question yeah, I just that, um, can I yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 I remember a project with students which we might have um, uh, but we looked at um, how to signal the deep future where nuclear waste was buried. And it was really interesting because everything we came up with, we would shut down because, you know, um, in the end we decided we didn't want to put a sign there at all. Um, never mind the visibility and whatnot. Because that would draw people's curiosity to avoid it. You could just <laughs> put pl plastic dead people around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And we ended up with rituals that would pass the memory from generation to generation. And I'm wondering if, in fact, we can encode an emotion or a, um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know if that's the right word, but I describe boring. Yeah, I, I, I'm really dissatisfied with Claude Shannon. I think, uh, I think meaning is an exponent to data, and that we, we yeah, there's no real true road to establishing quantity or meaning there's no rule you're going to have plato wanted to do that but he couldn't right he wanted to he wanted to quantify the forms he called them the forms but uh you know um but meaning is important it's like the it's a, it's um it supersedes information theory. It's the uh, it's it's tragic. So the tragedy of of our own era that meaning is so distorted and shoved down our throats with like twisted from some. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, 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 why not just simply let the parent free be them? Well, that's cheating. Like, cheating is great. I mean, cheating is <laughs> <pretty good. laughs> uh, cheating. Just <laughs> yeah, well, we know that nature is always all automatically writing into the into the cosmos there's a there's a kind of palimpsest of information already there my father used to tell me this story he was a chemist and he said photons have their effect on everything and so the shadow of this cloud that passes over the stone will leave its permanent imprint on the stone and eventually we'll be able to build an instrument with sufficient resolution to detect the fact that the shadow of this cloud passed over this stone and he said, like the shadow of the cloud, we imprint ourselves on everything we encounter, animate and inanimate. And that's uh, that's the soul, the thermodynamic soul, because it agrees with thermodynamics. And that's why it's immortal and it exists everywhere. And then when I came to MIT, I was reading a journal. And there was, a, in I think it was science. And in the journal, there was an article by a female geologist from Hawaii who studied these stones called tidal rhythmites, tidalites. 
and and these stones precisely record succeeding neap tides and spring spring tides, the high and low tides, annual high and low tides. And by looking at this stone, this geologist calculated the orbit of the moon, which is different than the moon, to, and the rotation of the Earth, which is different than the. She had a window on a planet we wouldn't recognize. and was able to read this off from the stone. I sent the journal article to my father, and he said, "See, I was right." <laughs> <laughs> but yes, there's a kind of there's a palimpsest already there. But it's not fixed. There's no like st there's no static map anywhere. Do you like the two sides? Well, this thing about the tragedy of history, uh, we want to we, we want some way to like to to, um, to oppose the forces of counter enlightenment, right? To um, to keep stuff archivally, and I think that's important. I, uh, I have a friend in Russia and, and another friend in Germany. The friend in Germany is an insect scientist who studies cockroaches, and the, and the friend in Russia is an artist who's incensed at the, um, the censorship of the internet, and so He's made these spiders to go out on the internet and get everything that's censored by the Russian government. And then we want to clone it with my friend in Germany, clone it into Russian cockroaches. It's a little subversive. <laughs> but it's a, it's a kind of archive too. archive. I mean, everything, there's layers of meaning on, on, under everything. Um, the sunset on the beach, you know, we see we're, in this era, we're supposed to be emotionally literate, right? Not scientifically literate. We're artists. We're emotionally literate. So we see the colors and the, the, the awesome. And we go, <gasps> and that's all we have to do. That's our whole interaction with the, never mind that the colors we see come from a incredible nuclear furnace going on this minute, 93 million miles away, and that there are the index of refraction of atmosphere and the particles suspended there. and the, that the, that the rainbow, the sunset is like vast into wavelengths that are imperceptible by the human sensorium and that the rocks on the beach, like my father's stones were, they're like postcards from a cosmos. We would lost worlds turned to salt and you know, dust. These things are there too. And if we, decide we, we choose not to see these things. See art, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna philosophize. Yeah. <laughs> art is supposed to describe the whole world. The problem with that, like quantum physics, and the problem with that is you can't describe something you choose to remain clueless about. It's, um, so if you, if emotional literacy is enough for you, then it's a brick wall. It's the blind leading the blind. My opinion. We also mentioned the rainbow. Yeah, we talked about this, yeah. When you look at rainbow, there are, there are no actual bands. It's just a bright spectrum. Continuum emission. Yeah. As of time, so when we are losing world, yeah, you always thought of speaking about losing worlds, um, you know, speaking a language of people who still think that there is um, 1.5 degrees to be managed to stick to it and uh, the technical solutions will save us and so on and so forth. So you speak the language of those people that went from a, a mere art historical sort of perspective. What's going on when they hear you and 
I mean, is there is it sort of a titanic battle happening in, in this uh, higher echelons that I can only imagine? You have to learn the right way to ask a question. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, you know, how do I do some this impossible thing? You go, um, I was thinking about doing this impossible thing. I was thinking it might work like this, 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 and this. And they'll go, hmm. No, it doesn't work like that, but that might work. <laughs> you know, it's um, it's about how we, and also the sort of like sort of rhetorical tricks, like you you expect them to say no right away, and so you phrase your question so you get no, like the preferred answer is no. <laughs> it's it's comes more naturally. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I have very positive and very lucrative relationships with the scientific community and not just in biology. Um, and uh, I, I value those enormously. And it's funny how many of my scientific colleagues walk around with poetic souls that are like 10 feet taller than they are. And they, you just have to teach them to acknowledge that. And uncovering paradoxes that sit right in front of your nose, that's really cool. Like mm -hmm. that's sort of like it automatically, there's a bridge. Mm -hmm. um, can, can I tell you about a paradox? Yes. <laughs> yes. It takes the human brain 80 milliseconds to, to, to recognize that the present just happened, right? Um, this is something that's been known since the 1950s, I think. Um, so we're always 80 milliseconds late. Um, we, by the time we, we're aware of something, it's already happened, we're recalling it from memory, and you'll note that anytime we recall anything, we're from memory, it's inevitably changed. Um, so we're physically, physiologically and neurologically incapable of being aware of the present in real time. Um, and what this means, of course, is that at this moment, you and I are not real. <laughs> the Earth spins on its axis at 1,037 miles an hour, about half a kilometer a second. The Earth orbits around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour, and the whole solar system is traveling in nearly circular orbit around the center of the Milky Way at about 220 kilometers per second. And the Milky Way itself is speeding through the cosmos at 1,300,000 miles an hour. So if you add all these velocities <laughs> together, <laughs> Uh, at this moment, reality is 31.168 or 50 kilometers away. That is the distance we've traveled in 80 milliseconds is what we think of as the present has actually been in existence is about 31 miles or 50 kilometers away. And the actual present, the one that we will eventually become aware of is therefore also about 50 kilometers away. In this sense, and at this moment, the whole human race is supernatural, very much like the angels. And this is a version of supernatural that also happens to agree with thermodynamics. <laughs> this is part of another talk. <laughs> yeah, that was clear. <laughs> I have a question for Bonnie here. Yeah. Just maybe a little introduction on how Bonnie and I met <laughs> through Mia. Actually, yeah, because, through Mia. <laughs> uh, Bonnie was looking for some kind of research project, and then Bonnie came to the IS here, and uh, we went to my favorite place, the attic. Maybe later for anyone who's interested, we can do a nice show you our favorite attic room. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, oh no, we met with Dark first. But yeah, that's another later yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, and then Bonnie uh, was doing research on Cleopatra, the alchemist, and the relationship to modern day chemistry. Uh, also, particular scientists. I am really interested in this theory on the origin of life. 
and somebody is now doing a research project around this and writing about it. So my question to you is, well, also, uh, Bonnie made a really nice podcast interviewing Joe for the BioArt Laboratory, so you can hear more stories there. And in this podcast, you mention or you say art is not um, a profession, it's a condition, is that the word? Yes. And I think Bonnie is really well on her way to sort of find her own path and then just uh, escape to MIT and set up a little alchemy lab. Yeah. So I, I was wondering, how did you get there? Like, and how is the Cleopatra alchemist inspiring you in this project? Can you elaborate? Um, two questions then. Well, <laughs> it's kind of connects to what Joe was saying earlier. You have to ask the right question and you have to, uh, be, because I was thinking one of the things that you, you just said, you have to just, do it and have an impossible idea and then find the right people to connect with and kind of make dreams come true and and just sort of uh, be a parasite and go to these different <laughs> places <laughs> okay maybe not a parasite maybe uh, um, Secret agent. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can go trust and then see um, who, because I don't have, well, I don't have the hard science background, but I know which, maybe which questions to ask and have ideas and then from there. And you can never do that alone. So. She's not afraid to learn anything. She spent uh, many, many hours in the MIT libraries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then you did Cleopatra still inspire you in this purpose? Uh, or alchemy? Wow. Well, well, good question. I have, to, I have to let that marinate in my brain that you did the question. Yes. And then we'll come back to it. Yes. I don't know if that directly inspired, inspired me in, in this. Did you wear something of like some kind of album? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's true. Yeah, this is um, in that sense maybe. Um, well, we were in in Jena and we were talking about truth. What are the other options of what what, what can you encode? And, and then we were thinking of an aroma, of perfume, and we wanted to see. Okay, maybe we can can encode a music piece in. In in um, and then I tried to set up a sort of alchemical lab to distill my own essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now we switch to synthetic, synthetic. So we're not. We're kind of. Digital. We can develop yeah. distill to something else. Yeah. In a way, your question was really lovely because um, <clears throat> when you went in didn't really know what to write your essay on or um, we're a bit lost if I may communicate that in the course at the start it was a totally different environment of course um, I didn't draw her to the philosopher's stone but to a pebble oh and yeah a, 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 a pebble um, and I, I said maybe just start with something really small like a pebble and everything is connected anyway. Mm -hmm. So as, a, uh, as an exercise, maybe creative writing or um, associating, um, finding a topic in that way, the, the pebble became the philosopher's stone. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or, or, so. Are there any like moments of like ethics that have entered your practice of like the kind of human agency to do these things, to modify things? Have there ever been like kind of conflicts or critiques through the process of being personally collaborating together? Have there been any moments where there has been these questions of ethics coming up? We always yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we're interested in the pharmacology of the ingredients of perfumes and how they have some some delightful pathological effects that we would like to avoid. Mm -hmm. So we, we 
we're not going to recommend application directly to the skin uh, as in a regular perfume. I mean, those kinds of things come up kind of constantly. But, but always, that, that's what we have been talking about teaching yesterday about working in a, in a lab. It, mm -hmm. It's that's always works and at least to keep in mind, you cannot just say, I make art so I can do whatever and yeah. just ignore the. A lot of, lot of so called fine artists try to use technology against itself and, and uh, violate ethical protocols and protocols from conduct, ethical conduct science. And I find that uh, makes me blisteringly angry. Because <laughs> um, you, you, you work so hard to open the doors of laboratories to like show that uh, that art can contribute to scientific knowledge. It's really important. It's like the renaissance we've been waiting for. And, uh, and that those kinds of shenanigans will shut the doors in our faces. It's terrible. Um, you know, like, oh, we're artists. We don't have any ethical constraints. <laughs> well, then, then mention something like forgery or plagiarism, and suddenly they have ethics. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah, none of my recombinant organisms have been released into the environment. They're all in, you know, BL2 or BL1 containment, depending on what they are, and in freezers and laboratories around the world. Um, even my recombinant plants are in special greenhouses mm -hmm. at Harvard. Um, I was wondering from my from my um, background in archaeogenomics, basically uh, using DNA as an archive as well in a sense. Um, I I sort of noticed that that the degradation of DNA is a very big issue, uh, and basically also that's why we why we. That's what I thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what Let's see if it's in an organism. Uh, uh -huh. The cells have this army of cellular repair enzymes that if there's if there's a mutation or mechanical damage, they can cover for it. And some organs, organisms are much better at it than others. And the halophiles that reside in salts can cope with it in an amazing way. That's what kind of is the culmination of many years of effort to consider those problems. Also, we've gone through all these like kind of DNA programming languages to uh, avoid any unnecessary translation of these databases into unwanted aberrant proteins or peptides. Mm -hmm. um, all that stuff has been a big issue as long as I've been in the practice. Yeah. But in some cases, though, like I genetically modified silkworms with the gene from jellyfish that, well, from a marine sponge that allowed me to, that allowed the silkworms to chelate their silk with metallic gold. And the silk itself is not regulated. The genetically modified silkworms and silk moths are, but the silk itself, the golden silk, <laughs> is fine. I mean, it, yeah, DNA itself. For the reason, the reason is because it's 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 everywhere. It's actually food. You can't uh, you have to, naked DNA is really hard to survive in the environment. There are all these enzymes called DNases and RNases that take care of the other principal nucleic acids that eat it up, break it into little pieces, and uh, yeah, I think that the, the trick to DNA archives, I think, is keeping it in really, really hardy life forms, like extreme plants. Yes, but I was wondering also, because you're also trying to encode in non-biological things right now, right? Mm -hmm. how, how does this uh, also, how is this also degraded in a sense? There's also interaction with the biological world, of course, especially with the... I guess we have to worry about erosion. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of things to keep in mind, like 
what if it rains and then yeah then your code gets overwritten immediately and, <laughs> and yeah and plants that take up the minerals and um yeah that's some that, there's a lot of questions a lot of things to explore a lot of things that we have to figure out that yeah but that's definitely it's something to think of. Exciting as well. Right? Yeah. yeah. It sort of gets rewritten. Then. Yeah, it gets rewritten then all the time. But maybe there's also a way to stabilize it in a way. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, that's why we also did this. Uh, we take the soil samples, we took the soil samples to see if we can. And the experiments yeah. with plant fixing yeah. precipitates and plants. Yeah. Hopefully, we won't kill the plants. Mm -hmm. Isn't this kind of erosion? Also noise, right? and noise is also part of communication. Right? We there are there are certain parts of the earth where the erosion is negligible and it's like just stuck in a time machine. Add a comet desert, for instance. But yeah, I mean, uh, it would probably probably be difficult to encode Amazonia. It would probably be difficult to encode the canals. You could probably encode them between tides. Manageable amount of material, but you but tied with right. um, yeah, we there's just a lot of things to think about. Did you have a question? Yeah, although I hardly dare, I'll be good advice to learn how to ask the right questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid right, this one is a really general one, but as I, I guess, as me and me, um, you like okay, that's a kind of generous <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you probably explained that, that you know, the EOS we function as a kind of incubator for the University of Amsterdam for interdisciplinary research and all kinds of complex scientific and societal problems. But we also want to um, intensify, intensify our work on, on art and, and science and function as an uh, incubator for the University at large to show what's possible and maybe uh, uh, make it results in a cascade of all kinds of beautiful experiments. So I want to ask your advice in a very general way: what what works and what doesn't work? Because we I think we all believe that indeed science can speak to art can speak to science, but there are so many variations possible to if we speak to people here for some combining art and science means well making use of the connections of the UVA for other means, more theoretical productions eh, to visualize what's going on. What you're doing is really research, of course, a really deep, fundamental. It's fun. What, what I don't works, think about what it work? deep. I think about it like fun. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, but, um, you know, you reach back 2,000 years to the <laughs> Caesar Augustus. And, Vitruvius, the namesake of Vitruvian man, he wrote a, a De Architectura, it's called. It's a great work. Was that this? Um, and in this book, he said, These are the things an artist, because an art and an architect was the same thing. These are the things we have to know. And I mean, that list would irritate a lot of our current artists. He said, we have to know geometry and optics. He said, we have to know how to write. We have to be good writers. We have to know draw, of course, because we're artists. We have to know something about history and natural and moral philosophy. We have to know about the laws of physics and what was it, the law and jurisprudence even, forget how he said it. And we have to know the proportions and the motions of the astronomical bodies and the proportions and the motions of the human body. And then he anticipated the next question, which is how does one human being keep all this stuff in his or her head? And he said, who said everything's connected to Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that if you just pay attention and you start at a young age, you can't stop. You can't not 
you receive these connections and that, uh, and that it's automatic. That is what the truth is. But try telling artists today that they have to learn arithmetic. Mm -hmm. I just find it too the rich tradition of art and mathematics is lost. Can I add something to that? Because just a practical thing is that I think also now I don't really know all the structures of the videos, but now there's also artists or people that want to learn something, but they are so in their that everything is so specialized that they don't get the chance to do that. So I think to just break it, break that open and also have people that have good ideas to offer them the space to do that. <laughs> when, you, when you think about it, in the, our distant ancestors knew, every, knew how to do everything they had to, you know, like make the tools and impress the boys or impress the girls. And, had to know what best what berry bushes were and how to like watch out for the cave bear and uh, you know medicinal stuff. They had to do make fire. They had to do all these things. And our problems come from the fact that we have decided that we do we will spend our whole lives doing one thing. We're going to go one way back and forth to work in one car and sit in one room while the sun goes like that and we're going to have one spouse and it's, <laughs> it's like all of our problems come from the fact that we forgot that we were somehow evolved to do it all. Well, there's this famous there's saying that the world has problems and university have departments. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed, I think this is one of the roles of the DS can be to, to irritate the system. For the Unification of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, maybe as a question from you to back to, to EIS, um, where published that article that they are wondering about? Can you answer that, or is that maybe also something EIS? Because it's so interesting what you said about we have an article we don't know where it's posted, and I think that that's that's so much a topic of uh, interdisciplinary. We'll, we'll probably figure something out. <laughs> but no, but, I mean, if, if you ask, if we ask you that question. I think that's also. I mean, the thing is, it's tough, you know, because you they're gonna you have to say this is chemistry, this is physics, this is biology, this is you know history, this is social science. Ah. Big Malian effect. Um, yes, big Malian effect in philosophy, uh, social science, um, cognitive science. There's this effect called the big Malian effect, and it means if you, if you start thinking about something in a, or someone in a certain way, that that just kind of gets automatically reinforced. Uh, if you think this person is a joke, the jerk, the way you relate to that person is that as if he or she is a jerk and all the people around and all that makes that person a jerk. It's like, and it's Pygmalion, the sculptor king who carved the beautiful stone and he wanted to bring it to life and the goddess took pity on him and brought Galatia to life. It's like we, the Pygmalion effect says all of our dreams come true. And right now, there's a lot of bad dreams out there. Just a lot of, some of us have to have a few good dreams. <laughs> the world depends on it. Yeah. One of the good dreams is artistic research. I think uh, this publication will have a very good home in an artistic research context. Mm. You know, one of the fallacies of bioarts, they, they say, oh, we're going to be doing this because we're going to start an argument. We're going to start a conversation, you know, about, you know, GM foods or global warming or something like that. And, you know, they kind of like overestimate who pays attention to art after all. It's not a whole society transformation. It's like, who goes to the art gallery? Who sees the work? Who cares about the work? It's, um, it's kind of nihilistic in a way. So, Grandizing to see, just assume that we're going to have this much 
impact on the world around us. But we have been having a lot of discussions about this as well, about with how to how to make this presentation and who, who gets to see it and what can we say and what can we not say and that, well yeah different environments. So what did you say you could not say? <laughs> not 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 say but um what is it that yeah. we're doing mm. in that sense and who listens to it mm. yeah we all listen to it, if I may speak for all of us with great interest. I think it gave so much beautiful poetic things to think about like what is information, what is life, what is meaning, how to convey meaning, who to talk to, how to listen. So I found it very beautiful. I'd like to thank you for coming all the way over to the Viva IS of Amsterdam. And especially also I'd like to thank Tony for organizing this event for bringing Joe here. It's really amazing to see how you've been moving around and everything you, you are discovering and um, yeah, through, through this presentation and through the trying like you are doing. I find it very inspiring also uh, to see that. She's, she's pushes, she, project that we described to you wouldn't have happened without her. She no. pushes. <laughs> Ask questions if anyone's interested. I can just give them a quick tour. Yeah. Um, can I get you a cigarette? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. You want to join? I would like to, but our first course is first. I think it involves some stairs. And I, I'm, not, I'm a really yeah. terrible video screen. Oh, yeah. We don't have an escalator in the other end. We can take it. Yeah. Okay, well, then we can call it. <laughs> <laughs> On the live stream. <laughs> I have to make my excuse because you're very organized. No, I, I, I said, oh, your laptop is like mine.